Are you a job seeker? A job seeker who is on the feisty side of 50? Mary Eileen Williams has interview tips for you. Plus, she wrote a book just for you. Welcome to Biz Story Shared, where storytellers share their inspiration, motivation, some disappointments, and how they applied the lessons that led them to success. Stories are gifts. Listen as these gifts are shared. Now, here is your host, Charlotte Plott. Okay, storytellers, this is Charlotte Plott. I am simply thrilled to introduce my guest today, Mary Eileen Williams. Are you ready to be a storyteller? I sure am, Charlotte. Oh, I am so anxious to hear what we're going to discuss today. Eileen, you are a job search expert, an author, a blogger, and a radio host. Your book, Land the Job You Love, 10 Surefire Strategies for Job Seekers Over 50, provides older applicants with information they'll need to successfully navigate today's competitive job market. Eileen also writes for Huffington Post and is the host founder of Feisty Side of 50. Doesn't that sound fun? All right, Eileen, I've given everybody just a brief overview. Here at Biz Story Shared, we start off every show with our guest's favorite quote. It's our way of getting the motivational ball rolling. So Eileen, what's your favorite quote and how do you apply this to your everyday thinking? Well, thank you for asking me that, Charlotte, because I got a great one. It's short but sweet. And it is the difference between the word try and the word triumph is just a little oomph. <laughs> and some days I'm oomphier than other days, but I do try to remember that. Another one I might add just kind of to go along with that one is the only way you can ensure failure is to quit. And so I think between the two of these, uh, it's kind of that stick to itiveness can make all the difference no matter what we're trying to do. Oh, that's so true. And so that's what you suggest to our listeners if they just keep trying. Yeah. I think that, that, yeah, that we have to, you know, again, have that longer range vision and realize that it may not play out always the way we, you know, we had thought it might come play out. Right. Kind of that thing about when you're on a sailboat and you're coming back to shore, you don't necessarily go straight ahead. You kind of tack back and forth because the wind blows you in different directions. Uh -huh. And I think the same holds true for any of the goals we have in life. Well, that's definitely true. Well, Eileen, in your book, you share advice on creating a 30-second branding intro, otherwise known as your elevator speech. And that is particularly helpful, that 30-second branding intro. So would you share with the listeners in more detail your advice on creating a powerful branding introduction? I'd be happy to, Charlotte. Now, mine is mainly focused at job seekers, of course, because that's my area of expertise. But I think as a small business owner, as an entrepreneur, as someone who wants to introduce themselves and maybe a product they have or a service, they can adjust it. They can tweak the basics of this and make something that would make people want to find out more about what they have to offer. So the first thing you want to do is obviously state the function you provide, whether you are a job seeker, that you know the type of job that you are going after, or your area of expertise, or if you are a business owner. Then, especially for job seekers, I think it's helpful to talk about the level of experience you bring uh, or maybe where you got it, um, various work environments. In my own case, I, I'm a career counselor. I had a private practice, but I've done outplacement consulting as well, where I work for organizations. I've taught at the university level. So I might get into some of these different environments where I can claim that my experience came from. And then, again, for job seekers, but again, tweak it a little bit if you're a small business owner, you want to think of a few skills that you provide, that you offer, that are current and in demand. And the way that you'll know what's current and in demand, again, especially if you're a job seeker, is to check the job postings. You'll see certain words come up over and over again. So you know, as a branding statement, you want to make sure that you are showing up as someone who is uh, current, 
uh, who is uh, got the skills that are, are in demand in the marketplace today, and who can provide the kinds of things that employers are looking to find. And then, as a job seeker, you'd want to end with with what you're looking for. And I'm looking to find uh, positions as a human resources generalist in small companies in the Bay, San Francisco Bay Area, or something like that. So you can let your listeners know how they might helpful, be helpful to you. But one thing I do want to stress, whether you're looking for a job or whether you have a business or something that you're trying to promote, you want to use something called speech softeners. And what speech softeners are, are things like my boss always compliments me on, or my friends always tell me that, or I pride myself on, or I think that. Because if you are writing a resume, again, as a job seeker, you can say something like demonstrated expertise in the following. <laughs> you can't say that out loud. But if you can think of some speech softeners that make it comfortable to you for you to quote unquote brag about yourself, or the product you provide or the service you have, I think that can be a way that you can present that information verbally and make it you know, something that's easier for you to do. Oh, that sounds wonderful. I've never heard of a speech software. It, it, and it really, it makes all the difference. I mean, again, if you have a small business, you can put, you know, things in a brochure about what you provide that can be very, you know, you know, very positive about, you know, how you'll make a difference and you do all these things. But sometimes verbally, it we just were brought up with you don't brag about yourself. A lot of us have had that as childhood lessons, and we continue to believe that at some level. So we by thinking ahead of uh, speech softeners that you can use that will make it comfortable for you to say something like that out loud, it can be really a lot of, it can make the difference between being able to do it fluently and confidently and not. So, yeah. That, that was just extraordinarily brilliant. I love that. <laughs> and so helpful for people because we, we have been taught that and, and you just taught us how we can do it and still be polite and still get our point across. Thank you for that. Well, thank you, Charlotte. <laughs> Many of us have heard of that term, elevator speech, and for some, it's really a, a challenge. But you've shown us how to make it interesting and memorable, and the listener want to do business with us or to give us a job. Thank you. That was good. Eileen, in writing your book, Land a Job You Love, you created a user's guide. It is actually a book workbook based on your years as an outplacement consultant. In a chapter called Knock 'em Dead Interviews, you coach your re readers through the five parts of a typical interview. Will you please explain a little more detail of the five parts? Well, thank you, Charlotte. I would love to do that as well. And really, interviews uh, will vary from time to time, but they're basically pretty much following this, again, this five-part format. So it's helpful to know up front what each one means and how you can best present yourself during each of these aspects of the interview process. The first is the icebreaker, and that is what we might say the chitty chatty stuff. You know, did you have any trouble finding us or, you know, whatever those kinds of things where the interviewer is trying to make you feel comfortable and you as the interviewee want to come back because with a friendly demeanor. And this is actually way more important than we might initially think. Again, it's not necessarily chit chat. If you consider that icebreaker part as your first impression, this is the initial rapport building or not aspect of a job search or I'm sorry, of the job interview. So you want to make very clear that especially your nonverbal messages are coming across clear. You want to, you know, smile, have good eye contact. When you shake hands initially, you want to make sure that firm, that handshake is firm, hold yourself erect keep your arms open, show a warm, inviting professional appearance. And again, that kind of combination of professionalism and warmth is what you want to get across in that icebreaker phrase. And then in general, most interviewers will begin with an open-ended or broad-based question or statement, something like, well, give me a little bit about your background. Tell me about yourself. What brings you here today? something like that. And all of this is basically a way at them getting at 
your, what we just talked about, your elevator pitch, <laughs> your branding statement. So you want to deliver something that is going to give them uh, the idea that you are coming there specifically for the position, for the company, for all these kinds of things. So as you are creating that elevator statement or that elevator pitch, you want to make sure that you focus that uh, primarily to this particular position. So when you think of skills you want to talk about or maybe add an accomplishment or two, you want to make sure that you are doing something that is going to engage your listener, engage your interviewer immediately and let them know that you are the right person for that job. So that background probe is important. It also can oftentimes direct the initial parts of the interview itself. You know, if you give an example of, well, I was able to save my pre previous company, you know, $50,000 by my ability to turn uh, products around quickly, something like that, then they might say something like, well, tell me more about that. And then that will go ahead and start that initial phase of the interview off with a bang and get you talking about things you want to talk about. The third part of the interview is basically the resume review. They'll sit there with your resume in front of them and ask you specifics about what you've written on that resume. So this, if you are a job seeker in that interview, you want to make sure that you can speak to all aspects of your resume. Back it up with examples. Now, you'll have examples on your resume, but you want to make sure that you've created perhaps additional examples for the interview process as well, because examples, as much as possible, prove within a conversational setting that you know what you're talking about. For, for example, about an example, if I ask you, Charlotte, do you work well under pressure? And you go, yeah. <laughs> Maybe you do, maybe you don't. But for example, I was able to handle multiple incoming lines of, you know, whatever. Those kinds of things will actually, again, prove what you are saying about yourself. So examples are important. The fourth part of the interview tends to be your questions. I would suggest people really make sure that they have good questions that show that they've done their homework, they know the organization, they know the field. Uh, many times these questions can be open-ended too. So you might want to ask the person, especially if they would be the hiring manager, what do you see to be the most critical aspects of the job? What needs to be done immediately within the next three to six months? And then you'll start to get underscore, understand what the hiring manager's real needs are that may not be in that job description. So your questions are important. You also want to uh, say, as I said, uh, educated questions that show them that you have taken the time, again, to have done that homework and you presenting yourself as what I like to say, a knowledgeable insider. Those two words, knowledgeable insider, are important. And then finally, the close, they'll say something to you like, well, thank you very much for coming. We appreciate your time. This is where we are. You know, we're going to be interviewing several other people and we'll let you know. And this is where you can make or break that interview many times because you want to show enthusiasm for that position and enthusiasm for that opportunity. So you'd want to say something along the lines of, now that we've had this conversation, and I would use that word conversation maybe rather than an interview, now that we've had this conversation, I am even more interested in the position. Can you tell me what the next steps might be? Something like that. So they know, again, that you are interested in that job specifically. Wow. I think I would get it, could get a job with all of that information. <laughs> well, <thanks for> that. <laughs> that is really profound. Thank you for sharing all of those. That's going to be really helpful to anyone who is looking for a job. That's amazing. Good. Thank you. And it, it really does help us to know and understand the parts of a typical interview so that we can be better prepared. Like what you said about asking if they ask you if you have any questions I know I said no <laughs> but you gave some really good examples of some questions to ask that that was uh, very good I can see why you have such a, a good following with your uh, feist, feisty side of 50 program well, thank you again, Charlie. <laughs> These wonderful compliments. I'm going to get a big fat head here, but I'm loving it. <laughs> well, I believe that preparedness really does increase our self-confidence when, when we're under, under stress. And the most one of the most important terrifying parts of an interview, I think, if you're over 50, is how 
one should handle the age-related question. How should that be handled? Well, there are a couple of ways to do it, but primarily I always suggest uh, people that I work with, I say, think politician. You know, when politicians answer questions, they answer it, but they're kind of, you know, maybe not too specific. So positive and vague are my, again, my, my suggestions for that. So if you are asked, well, what do you plan to be doing in five years or something like that? Because a lot of times a stereotype might be that an older worker would actually just want to work for a little while longer and then we want to retire. However, in reality, workers over, or employees over 50 stay in jobs three times longer than younger workers. It's the young ones that bounce around all the time. We're the ones that grew up with a sense of, you know, loyalty and you know, those kinds of things. So uh, actually, if you are asked, say, where do you want to be in five years, I would suggest using, uh, again, positive and vague, using one of those grow with the company, grow with the position, ex you know, it, it answers. So you might say something like, well, I'm sure in a position such as this or in a company such as this, so you're kind of unconsciously putting yourself in that position. In a position such as this, you will provide me a number of opportunities to grow my skill set. I like what I do and I think I'm good at it, but there's always room for improvement. Those kinds of things that, again, are positive and a little bit on the vague side. Another thing you might do is if you are actually stepping down, say you had been a manager at one point and you really at, you know, at this age, you decide I, I'd rather do the job myself and not necessarily manage others. You can say something, this phrase, at this point in my career, and I think that's very helpful to say. So at this point in my career, although I loved managing when I was doing it, I have found that I get my real passion comes from rolling up my sleeves, doing the job and seeing a tangible result from my efforts. So there's ways that you can turn even, you say, like taking a step backward into a positive. So you do any of those age related types of questions, think positive and vague and create examples before you go into that interview so that those kinds of questions don't throw you. Those are just excellent, excellent examples because the circumstances that surround why a person over 50 is looking for a job can certainly cause the applicant to find it difficult to bring it into the forefront their thinking of, that they have value and that their experiences and skills are can be a benefit to the company. Well, when, when your book is read, there is valuable insight that helps the applicant as they fill in the blanks so they don't go into the interview unprepared about what to say. So that's a tremendous help that there are actually uh, pages in the workbook with those kind of questions. And do you give those kind of examples? in your book? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, in fact, I have examples for frequently asked questions. And then again, as you say, like there's fill in the blank answers so people can customize it to their own careers and their own needs. Uh, but I also give other ways of creating your own examples um, uh, in case you get something called a behavioral style interview question, which would be something like, give me an, an example of a time when you blank. So I talk about all of that because yeah, examples, as I said earlier, when we, we were talking about the five-part interview format, examples prove as much as possible, again, within a conversation that what you are saying or what you are claiming about yourself is true. Those behavioral interviews, if you're not prepared for it, they can really, really um, throw you and put you in a tizzy and just say, oh, I don't want this job anyway. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Charlotte. <laughs> Well, Eileen, with all of your specialty work as an author and the founder of the Feisty Side of 50 radio show and blog, along the way, you might have had some failures. Now, I want to ask you to tell us of one of those times when you just didn't get the results that you set out to achieve. You failed, maybe fell flat on your face. Will you tell us that story, just like we were sitting there with you, and most importantly, the lessons that you learned? Well, boy, I failed more than once, I'll tell you that. But that kind of thing about stick to or stubbornness or whatever it is has kind of pulled me through. But uh, after, uh, when I decided that I wanted to do something a little bit different than the outplacement work I've been doing, um, although I love working with people and I love the helping them that way, I thought, you know, I'd like to try more writing. So I decided I was going to write the definitive book on baby boomer women. 
Uh, I, I did a lot of research. I, I, I tried to bring in all sorts of elements that impacted the generation of the boomers. And so I got into women's history. I got into male and female, the differences between our brains, because that kind of brought back the, you know, the old gender battles of the 70s and all these kinds of things. I thought this was going to be, you know, my life's work. Well, it took me six years, and I finally got it. Um, I finally got an agent. Uh, I, I went to the San Francisco. I live in the Bay Area, and I went to the San Francisco Writers Conference, got an agent, was just thrilled, figured this was it. I was going to be famous, all these kinds of things. And uh, she started to pitch the book, and it was, I know exactly, I believe it was October 2008, just when everything oh, went oh. kaplooey. <laughs> and so nobody was willing to take a chance on an unknown and I got things like well who cares about baby boomer any women anyway all these kinds of things well I was crushed for sure crushed and um, but as many times as when we look back over our lives uh, it actually turned into a blessing, and I know you probably want to hear about that too, yes. right? Yes, I do. <laughs> well, actually, I thought many times um, if I, that book had been published, uh, I doubt I would have made the New York Times bestseller list. I doubt it would have been quite what my dreams had uh, envisioned it to be. Uh, but I did learn something very, very valuable in that process, and that was I needed to build a platform. And so what that did is building the platform had me start my blog, had me start my radio show, which eventually led to writing for Huffington Post. And now I actually do have a national presence. So uh, if you look at my name on Google, you'll see, a, you know, a number of pages and various uh, citations for that. So uh, it, this has actually turned into something that it, it benefited me at the end. Who knew? I had no idea. I thought my life was over, as I said. But in many ways, it just started opening all sorts of new doors and new opportunities for me. Wow. Well, what an exciting turnaround that was for you to have it. And you, you can't see those kind of things are, are going to be what the future is like. But good for you for persevering. And just you really do keep trying, don't you? <laughs> Thanks, Charlotte. <laughs> yeah, it could be called stubbornness. But hey, sometimes stubbornness can be good, right? <laughs> it can. Yes, you bet it can. Well, now, is that what I was going to ask you what your aha moment was when you became aware of the new path you wanted to travel? Was that what it was? Actually, yeah, that that it went from kind of the depths of despair to like, wow, maybe this wasn't so bad. And, you know, maybe everything worked out OK in the end. And I know from being a career counselor and working with people many times when we look back over our careers or our lives in general, it turns out that some of the things that we have had considered our biggest defeats or our biggest failures actually turned into a blessing. And I, I consider this one to be a big blessing for me. Well, I can see it. So it was just a stepping stone to your um, future life and the, the successes that you have, that you have succeeded in. I don't know what to say there. You, you really made it. You climbed the pinnacle. Good for you. Well, I know that you have probably looked back over those times and and it just feeds your creativity to keep going, doesn't it? And being successful now helps helps us to learn what the customers need from us, what your your over 50 people need from you because you've endured those struggles. That's for sure. Well, did you ever receive any business advice along the way? Well, yes, and maybe not specific. I mean, business, but I think this has to, the advice that I treasure the most has to do with a lot of aspects in life, a job search, business, anything. And that is, I think if we get out of our own skin and focus on our customer, I have to say our client, in my case, maybe it'll be a job search client or my audience, I do a lot of public speaking. And uh, if I worry about, gee, am I sounding good? Am, am I the conversation flowing? If I worry about myself, I get all nervous. If I worry about, am I helping them and am I giving them the information they need, then everything seems to work out just fine. So I think that really, you know, give your customers everything that you can, really respect their needs and wishes. I think that that's number one. And I also think karma is a 
very important. Uh, you know, you look around and sometimes you see people that are successful that seem to have, you know, be mean or nasty or selfish or whatever, and you wonder how they got where they did. But I kind of think they're not going to last that way because I think that people who are giving and caring, such as you, Charlotte, who are doing this wonderful service for your listeners, I think that that, you know, turns around and comes back to you. And maybe it's a universal law or whatever, but I do believe in karma and, and putting the needs of other people, you know, right up there as number one. Right. That, that really does have to be number one. So thank you for reminding us of that. Well, now I'm going to ask you some specific ways that show how you achieve becoming such a successful author and blogger. Does that sound like a plan? Sounds like a plan. Good. Do you have a vision for your blog or another book that you'll be writing or what do you see for the radio show? Well, uh, actually, um, the radio show is, I am very lucky because I got uh, on a list of um, PR agents, actually, and I have been given a number of opportunities to interview well-known figures, uh, really well-known figures, I'm happy to say, and especially uh, well-known figures who've written books because they're marketing those. So what radio show is kind of perking along. The blog, uh, again, is, is, is pretty popular. If you Google baby boomer women, it usually comes comes up number three, so I'm very happy with that. But the area where I want to grow more is, and I started it and kind of put it aside for a while, but I think there's a need for this. Again, if I focus on my customers' needs, and that would be something I'm calling two-minute tips, where I want to start doing more of a video series where I give short, you know, again, very brief, but very salient, you know, important points for job seekers so that they can kind of click through these tips and say they have an interview or what are the three things you need for an interview or they have something important coming up or they, you know, the three top tips for your resume, but something where it's, you know, a two or three minutes long and something brief, succinct, uh, but to the point and helpful. Oh, that, that's an extraordinary idea. I, I know that that will be much appreciated by the people that are looking for jobs and just to be able to go and find it easily and see a, a tip that just gives them the confidence as they're walking out the door that, that they are going to do their best. Wow. Do you have a, a time frame for that? Uh, well, actually, as I said, I've kind of put it aside for a while, but I think I'm going to start gearing up on, uh, I don't have any specifics. I know when you make goals, you're supposed to put a time frame on it, but uh, certainly by the beginning of the following year, I want to have several of them in the can, so to speak. Oh, good for you. I like that. Well, be sure you let us know when that's done. Now, can you share one of your personal habits that you strongly believe contributes to your success? Well, I, uh, again, the stick to or stubbornness uh, is one, um, but I do think probably I'm fairly well, not always, but I'm fairly well organized. And I think that that is important. Um, I like to, uh, you know, if I say I'm going to do something, I really want to follow up as much as possible. Um, you know, the things happen and, and actually we were going to do this a while back. And I definitely had some technical difficulties on my side, but you were so gracious about it. And, you know, I think people understand, but I do think, especially Especially if you're in business um, and if you want to be, uh, again, if you want to be looking for work and present yourself as a, as a candidate who, you know, of value, I think you pretty much need to think your word is your bond as much as possible. Right. I, I do too. And technical things, was, we most usually cannot do anything about them. We just have to go, what's that? You go over them, around them, and under them, and, and look at you. You're on top now. <laughs> Thanks, Charlotte. Yes. Well, what is the number one most effective job search tool that older workers sh could use? This is not only the number one job search tool for uh, applicants, uh, that seasoned applicants, I like to call us, or mature applicants, but it's also the same thing if you are building a business, if you are you know, creating a service or anything like that. So if you're an entrepreneur or a job seeker, networking by far it, studies show that um, at least three quarters of jobs are gotten by way of personal referral. In other words, networking. Now, I don't care, you know, how many, so people spend hours and hours on the internet. Okay, that's okay. And you can say LinkedIn is a form of networking. 
But you know, Charlotte, because we are, uh, you know, looking at one another, that face-to-face -face interchange it makes your connection so much stronger. And I think that that is so true. So a personal network, uh, something, somebody that you've met in, in the flesh or had at least some kind of a visual, you know, interchange with, I think can make things so much better for you, whether you're building a business, whether you're uh, looking for work. And the 75% thing uh, for a job search, it goes up even more the older you are, because a lot of times too, your, your resume might not hold up to someone in their 40s who might have been in that uh, career even longer than you say, or has a you know, different experience than you. So what you want to do is get through the door by way of personal referral and have someone really, you know, give you that, we call it the halo effect, give you that halo effect. So that people want to talk with you and they want to meet you initially and immediately because they get that, um, referral from someone that they value, uh, either a, an employee, a valued employee or a coworker or a colleague. Right. Oh, that's that's very good advice. Thank you for that. Well, now I want to know, how do you get guests for your radio show? Well, as I said, I uh, sometimes I seek them out, but mostly I uh, again, I, I've been very lucky to be on this list so that that uh, PR people tend to seek me out. You know, they'll they'll put out something about someone has written a book. Would you, you know, and they'll be available on such and such a date. Would you like to interview them? And so I, I as I said, had an opportunity to interview people I never thought I'd have the chance to interview. Well, that has to be exciting. That's it is. Exciting. It is. Well, of course, the book that you wrote, "Land the Job You Love: Ten Surefire Strategies for Job Seekers Over 50." is one that we want to refer our listeners to today. But do you have another favorite that you'd like to share or recommend? Uh, as, as far as something that I might refer job seekers to, you mean? Yes. Yeah. Yes, well, a couple of things. Um, I think that uh, I, if I might, <laughs> again, kind of ring my own or blow my own horn, you know, I was going to go ring my chime, blow my horn, but whatever. Uh, I do think I've written at this point about 60 plus articles for Huffington Post. So if you go to Huffington Post and put in Mary Eileen Williams, and that's Mary E-I-L-E-E-N Williams, you'll find them. And they're, they're for basically for Huff post 50. So it's for mature job seekers. But I think that that would be a good resource for someone looking for work. Another um, online resource that I recommend uh, to job seekers um, would be something called gibberjobber.com. And that's J-I-B-B-E-R-J-O-B-B-E-R.com. And what they do is they help you uh, with organizational tools. So, you know, you've got to call somebody back, you know, in three weeks, how are you going to remember? to do that. This is a great tool. Uh, they help you organize a lot of aspects of the job search. And as I mentioned too, I think organization is key uh, because you do want to make sure that when you committed to something, you follow up on it. Oh, that's excellent. Excellent advice. And um, I'm going to check out that site. It does sound really good. And thank you for sharing that. Well, Eileen, I have truly enjoyed Listening to your journey and the stories that you shared were inspiring and so informative and educational. You went above and beyond what you shared for us. I know that it's just such a, an abundant amount of information for people. That's, that's wonderful, very generous of you to do that. So will you please share one more time how we can be in touch with you and any other resources that you have, and then we'll say goodbye. Well, I would like to say first off, Charlotte, thank you. You are doing such a wonderful service for not only providers, service providers, or people who authors like me, uh, and I know you interviewed Susan Rowan, who wrote a wonderful book, How to Work the Room, and uh, you just have done you know, a lot for this, but you also are doing a lot for your audience because I think, you know, by following you and, and seeing some of the people that you're interviewing or listening to some of your interviews, people are going to come away with a lot of helpful information. So I'd like to start out by saying thank you to you. And as far as any additional ways that I might be able to serve people, again, they can go to my website, which is feistysideof50.com. Uh, 
Uh, and also, if they're interested in finding the book, they can find it on Amazon. Uh, and then also, as I said, too, um, I would suggest if you are looking for work and you are in that, you know, 50-ish range, I mean, you can be 48 and a half, <laughs> but any of that midlife range or a little bit above, I think that um, you might find some of those articles helpful, too. So you just go to Huffington Post and put my name in. But uh, those would be my suggestions, Charlotte. Well, those, those are wonderful. And thank you for sharing sharing all of those. And um, listeners, the, we will have the links to these resources and everything else that we've been chatting about in today's episode by going to bizstoriesshare.com, feistysideof50.com. Mary, Eileen, Williams, thank you. This has just been so wonderful. I'm so glad that I got to meet you and that um, we had this time together. Is that a song? Thank you for this time. No, that's so. <laughs> All right. Um, we'll say goodbye now. Thank you. Well, thank you, Charlotte. Give the storyteller some love. Go to bizstoryshared.com, click on the iTunes button, and give a five-star review. Thanks.